Okay, well today we're going to be talking about Hume's critique of the arguments we've looked at, and especially the design argument. We presented first versions of the cosmological argument, um, which are empiricist arguments in the sense that they start from experience. They are a posteriori. They are based on experience, at least the experience of the world as existing and containing causal series. And then we looked at the design argument, and that too is based on experience. An experience of the world is intricate, successful, um, as being like an artifact in various of its properties instead of being just like some naturally found object, a rock, uh, a tree, etc. And now what we're going to look at is Hume's critique, especially of that design argument, in something called the Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. This is something that is a dialogue. There are several different characters, one of whom presents these arguments, one of whom uh, critiques them rather uh, delightfully, and one of whom seems for sort of to be playing the middleman, trying to actually find some middle ground. In any case, there is an argument about which character really represents Hume. Most people think it's Philo, the skeptic who is attacking these arguments. A few think it is some other character who's trying to find that middle ground. In any case, here is the beginning of his criticism. Paley's argument starts from the analogy with a watch. Remember, you're walking there on the beach, and you find a watch. And immediately, you conclude that that watch had a maker. It had a designer. It's not like the sand around it. Why is it different? Well, we looked for criteria of declaring that something is an artifact, something produced, designed, made, as opposed to something merely found in nature. And the thought was the universe as a whole is like a watch. It is like that in the sense that it is intricate, it is successful, and it exhibits that property of sensitivity. That is to say, you can't mess with it too much and still have it work. Now, Hume says at the beginning, that analogy of the universe to a watch, how strong is that really? We argue by analogy all the time. People think about the atom, for example, and probably when you were learning atomic theory, in high school chemistry or physics, you thought of the atom as something like a little solar system with the nucleus in the center, sort of like the sun, and the electrons going around, something like the planets. And that's a very useful analogy and a very helpful model. So there's nothing wrong with arguing by analogy and reasoning by analogy. In fact, you might argue that fundamental, not only to science, but to all thinking, really, is developing models of a phenomenon you're trying to understand and thinking through those models. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with reasoning by analogy and using those models. But why is this the right model to use? So Hume says, wait a minute. Why think that the universe itself is actually like a watch, that it is an artifact, that it had a designer and a maker? What if it's self-organizing? What if it's a system that just sort of organizes itself, goes from an initial state that doesn't look at all like an artifact into something like this state? For example, the Big Bang. Suppose you were actually somehow per impossible there to witness the Big Bang. Initially, it isn't going to look like it was designed, right? There's just chaos. There are things flying all over the place, this rapidly expanding universe. It's not going to look like it has an intricate structure of the kind that the universe might appear to have now. Similarly, if you were back in time to witness the Earth when it was still in this gaseous state, just starting to coalesce, it wouldn't look like something that really showed these signs of design that Paley talks about. And yet, the universe has managed to organize itself into solar systems, into planets, and then into all the various things around us that we see. So why not think that the universe is really self-organizing? Why, for that matter, think of it as being like a machine? He says, is it really that much stronger to think of the universe like a watch instead of, for example, an animal or a vegetable? What if you thought of the universe as something like a carrot <laughs> or a carrot plant? What if you thought of it as something like a plumbago that starts out with like, you know, something that doesn't look like much of anything and then grows up and has these beautiful blue flowers? Or what if you thought of it as an animal? Then. Well, those are alternative conceptions of what the universe might be like. Now, I think Hume is putting out an interesting challenge here. Suppose I were to put on an exam, <laughs> the universe is like a blank. And then I didn't give you the choices, right? The A, B, C, D, etc. I just said the universe is like a what? 
What might you say? He says a sausage. <laughs> no, I said a box of chocolate. Oh, a box of chocolate. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, all right, that makes more sense than the sausage business. <laughs> okay, the universe is like a box of chocolate. So we have Forrest Gump in the first row. Now, <laughs> what else uh, might you use as an, a an, an analogy? And what might you have thought of as an analogy in particular before you walked into a philosophy class this fall? Would you have known what to say at all? And if you did have any ideas, you know, imagine that you're there, you've got to come up with some quote, some saying for your high school yearbook, pressure's on, deadline's there. Somebody says, oh, do you want a quote there? Or, you know, some saying? Yeah, the universe is, uh... <laughs> what would you say? Pressure's on. No? Anybody? Yeah? A four-dimensional donut. A four-dimensional donut. All right, that's an awesome answer. Homer Simpson type answer. Yeah, it's like a donut. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what else might <laughs> you use? Yeah? A puzzle. A puzzle. The universe is a puzzle. It's a what? Balloon. It's a balloon. Ooh, nice. Yeah? Uh, looking glass. The universe is like a looking glass. Yes. Like a sandbox. Ooh. <laughs> I like this. This is a fun game. We can go on like this for quite a while. Anyway, notice some of those things, in fact, most of those things, were not artifacts. Uh, some of them are, I guess, a looking glass, a mirror, is something people produce. Though you could also think, well, gosh, I can see my reflection maybe in a pond or other things that are not artifacts. So, in short, and a puzzle, well, yes, it's generally an artifact, but I suppose you could find a puzzle in nature, and if you mean conceptually a puzzle, it looks as if all of, uh, anyway, those are a variety of things that go in a different direction, that actually aren't machines, but also aren't animals, aren't vegetables, and so it's, no, oh no, it's by no means obvious that these arguments are giving us the right analogy. Now, Hume says, but let's take that analogy seriously for a moment. It might not lead in the direction that Paley and others want it to lead in. Why? because it seems to imply that God is not infinite. At least it allows for that possibility. I don't look at a machine like a watch, and uh, for example, here's my watch, uh, and I don't look at it and say, wow, Apple must be infinite, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and Apple is very big, it's very powerful, it is not infinite, it is not all powerful, it is not all knowing, though. <laughs> I worry things are going in that direction. Uh, and so you might think, look, there's a real danger here of overgeneralizing. A watch is a pretty impressive thing. Whoever designed and made the watch, they knew a lot of stuff. On the other hand, you could also think, ah, yeah, but that doesn't mean they're all-knowing, all-powerful, infinite in any respect. He says, by this method of reasoning, you renounce all claim to infinity in the attributes of the deity. For as the cause ought only to be proportioned, to the effect, and the effect so far as it falls under our cognizance is not infinite, what pretensions have we upon your suppositions to ascribe that attribute to the divine being? In other words, the watch we find is not infinite, so we don't conclude that the watchmaker was infinite. Similarly, we don't find an infinite universe, so we don't have any reason to attribute it. Well, maybe we do. So it's still controversial among physicists whether the universe is infinite or finite. But in any case, if it's not infinite, we don't have any reason to attribute infinity to its maker. Now, of course, maybe you think, actually, it is infinite. And at the time Hume was writing, the main model of the universe was Newtonian. And there, it looked like space and time really were infinite. Space was this infinite expanse. And so if you think that, then maybe you've got an answer to Hume. Maybe you can say, well, actually, wait a minute. Uh, the universe is infinite. And it could be, so it might turn out that actually the argument isn't as bad as Hume seems to think. Yeah? The reason I said donut is because if you start at any point in a donut and you keep going, you end up where you are. And if the universe were shaped like a four-dimensional donut, no matter which direction you went, you end up back where you are. So the universe is both infinite and finite at the same time. Ah, OK. Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. I want an infinite donut. See, now I get distracted. I think, oh, they, have you ever been to Round Rock Donuts? Yeah. They make these giant donuts. 
it's like, well, imagine an infinite donut. <laughs> anyway, I love it. But yes, um, if you think that the universe actually does have this shape of a donut, then actually thinking about it, whether it's finite or infinite, leads you into that sort of puzzle. In one sense, it's infinite, and in another sense, not. It's sort of both finite and infinite, and the structure of the universe really might be like that. Yeah? But the universe is expanding, so it must have been Ah, oh, if the universe is expanding, then it used to be smaller. On the other hand, there are different degrees of infinity um, and different sizes of infinite sets, for example. So, so yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to think about. Anyway, uh, if you're interested in this, our physics department is one of the greatest in the world, and there are all sorts of people here who study cosmology and think about the Big Bang and the overall structure of space-time and so on, so ask them these questions. Don't ask me, and certainly don't ask Hume who doesn't have a clue, but anyway. <laughs> if we go further, though, notice it's not just infinity. There, actually, the Newtonian or the contemporary physicist might actually have a response to say, well, actually, the universe is infinite. However, what about perfection? It's not only that we conclude that God is an infinite being. God is supposed to be the perfect being. But the universe, it sure doesn't look perfect. And so, for example, the watch. The watch might be very good, and so you might conclude that its maker is actually a very good watchmaker. However, it's not perfect, and so we don't conclude that the watchmaker is perfect. Now, is the universe perfect? What is our evidence that a designer and maker of this universe had to be perfect? Yeah? Natural laws never fail. Ah, okay, we could look for instances of perfection. For example, we could say natural laws never fail. And so if that's true, then maybe we've got some argument that, well, there's a kind of perfection here. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of imperfections, uh, like some of your quiz grades. <laughs> but, on <the> other hand, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, you know, uh, that, look, I mean, there is perfection. There's the perfection of some of your quiz grades. There's the perfection of natural law. There's the perfection of the circle. Um, you know, and so on and so forth. So you can find maybe examples of perfection in this work. Yeah. Well, natural laws haven't failed yet, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> if infinite, technically, it would fail at some point. Natural laws haven't failed yet, he says. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, there's this spiritual that um, someone wrote not too long ago, actually, uh, called He Never Failed Me Yet about God. <laughs> and it always bothers me because I think, you know, that. Is that really the believer's confidence in God? Hey, God, you haven't failed me yet. <laughs> That's kind of like, yeah, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend saying, you haven't been unfaithful to me yet. <laughs> like, huh, I, yeah, thanks a lot for that praise. <laughs> anyway, yes? Ah, well, okay, good. Um, it's hard to say exactly what the analogy is supposed to show us in this respect, because, after all, if the universe is imperfect, should we conclude that God is imperfect? Maybe it weakens the argument for God's perfection, but on the other hand, it doesn't seem to establish imperfection either. So, here's how Hume phrases it. The world, for aught he knows, is very faulty and imperfect compared to a superior standard. And it was only the first rude essay of some infant deity who afterwards abandoned it, ashamed of his lame performance. It's the work of some dependent, inferior deity. And it's the object of derision to his superiors. Maybe it's the production of his old age and dotage uh, for some superannuated deity. And ever since his death has run on at, at adventures from the first impulse and active force. So in other words, he's saying, look, we look at the universe, and it's true, it doesn't prove God's imperfection if there are imperfections and for evils and so on in this universe. But on the other hand, it isn't strong a strong argument for a perfect deity either. We could look at this and say, hey, what if, what if this was a baby divine being who was just playing out, like, like you put a small child in the sandbox, right? They build this little thing. It's going to be pretty imperfect. Uh, maybe this was the toy universe for a baby god. <laughs> uh, you know, daddy <coughs> and mommy god put baby God <laughs> in the sandbox and the sand baby God made our universe, right? Well, what about that? Is that possible? Or, you know, what if it was some minor deity? What, in fact, uh, 
Philo of Alexandria thought that the angels were delegated the task of making the universe. So what if um, really it was some lesser deity that did this, some divine being, but not that divine? Or what if it was some very old god whose last act was to make this universe, and it was filled with imperfections as a result of that? In any case, he says, you know what, here's part of the problem. How do we know whether a watch, for example, is a good watch or a bad watch? We compare it to other watches. How do we know whether a shirt is a good shirt or a bad shirt? It's partly whether it fulfills its function well, but to some extent, we compare it to other shirts. And so, what about the universe? Here's the problem, we can't compare it to other universes. We can't say this is an excellent universe or a bad universe because we have no grounds for making the comparison. And, by the way, we can't really use the function because we don't know what it's for, <laughs> so we don't know whether it's doing it well or badly, but we compare it to others. Well, what do you mean, what others? It's impossible for us to tell, given our limited views, whether this system contains any great faults or deserves considerable praise. Um, one of my favorite little cartoons there from my grad school days uh, is up there, Parallel Universes, where you've got these things that are in some abstract sense uh, similar. And the question is, well, okay, which of those would be a better universe? Who knows, right? Um, over there, Mrs. N is baking cookies. There, Mrs. BBB is baking pilkers. <laughs> Here, uh, TRR is baking shoo, and there, just, well, <laughs> you have a sculpture looking like that. Anyway, which of those is better? I don't know. So even if we could think about alternative universes and imagine possible worlds, as science fiction writers, for example, do, we may not be able to tell which is a better universe. Now Hume says, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so do we need to compare this universe to other universes because, for instance, with the watch, just because, like, if I look at my watch and I'm late to class, that's not a failure of the watch. The watch still did its job a ton of time. Right. So, so what I was trying to say with the natural laws earlier is that the universe's job is to make those natural laws. If we consider the universe's function as gravity and whatnot, the laws are consistent, then it hasn't failed us in the same sense that if something bad happens in the universe, it's not the natural law to fault. In the same way that if you look at a watch and the time is bad because you know you may be late to class, that's not the watch's fault. All right. Well, not, yeah, that's an interesting perspective. You could say, look, um, the function of the universe is actually to be a system exemplifying these natural laws, and it does that perfectly. It exemplifies those natural laws. Those natural laws have no exceptions. They do not break. Um, footnote here, think about the possibility of miracles and what that might imply for this argument. But in any case, you could think, all right, that's the point of the universe. And to see whether it's fulfilling its function, I just have to look for violations of natural law within it. I don't have to compare it to any other universes. Just as, is this a good shirt? You might say, as long as I know what shirts are for, I can evaluate that without comparing it to any other shirts. There are probably devices you have where you have only one of them. And how good a device is that? Well, to some extent, you just assess that on the basis of how well it does what it does, right? You may not have compared it to anything else. Um, what's an example of something like that? Let's say at some point you receive or you buy one of these things, and you know that's all you ever have, and you don't know how to compare it to others. Yeah. A printer. A printer. Maybe you get a printer. And is that a good printer? Well, hey, it prints stuff, and so it, you know, or it's constantly breaking down and jamming and stuff, and you know it's not a good printer, and you don't really have to compare it to other printers to find that out. Um, might be a husband or a wife is like that, right? I mean, uh, is this, you know, is that a good husband, a good wife? Well, you hope it's not through comparison with others that you answer that question. Um, yeah. Would that be like comparing, uh, like you say, blue and red? Blue is better than red. Oh, okay, good. Um, that is one way of thinking about this universe question. If you do have to make the comparison, then you could say, uh, I don't know how to do it. What am I looking for? Just like if somebody says, which is a better color, blue or red? You say, I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know how to compare those. I don't have a category for making that comparison. So similarly, if I say, which of those universes is better? I don't have any criteria for deciding that. Now, I can imagine some criteria that I could use. Let's say, oh, we've got our universes that currently exist, and now we've got a hell dimension 
where, yes, there is life, but all life is being tortured by these savage demons. Is that a better or a worse universe? I, I feel confident saying, yeah, it seems like a worse universe. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, within a very wide range, I think you're right. We're not going to really have any criteria. So here, you know, gosh, there are lots of planets with life. In this universe, there's only one. Which is better? I, I don't know. And in general, we're going to face a lot of cases where you're right. We just won't have any criteria. Yeah? Uh, back to the watch thing, I think you would still need another watch of carriers. Because if you imagine a universe with only a watch, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it's running fast or slow or on time. Oh, well, yeah, watches are interesting in that respect because time is something like a conventional construct and you have to compare it to something to know whether it's keeping proper time. Um, there was a watch I had that actually I, you know, I thought was a great watch and then I started noticing I was always late. <laughs> and I, I, I began to you know, think what psychologically is happening to me? Why am I always late? I'm, I've usually been a punctual person and and now I'm not, by the way, I'm always late to everything now, but that's, <laughs> that's due to old age and uh, being too busy and saying yes to too many things. It's not due to a malfunctioning watch. But back then, it was due to the fact that my watch was, I thought, keeping great time until I noticed I was always late. And then I realized, oh yeah, um, my watch says, you know, it's 1 o'clock, and that clock says it's 1.05. Uh-oh. And the same thing was happening in my car. Um, it was gaining like five minutes a day <laughs> at one point. So, so you're right. With watches, we do, in a sense, have to make a comparison. Part of what a watch is supposed to do is keep me coordinated with everybody else. And if it's not doing that, it's bad. Now, what if there were earlier botched universes, Hume says? Maybe many worlds have been botched and bungled throughout all eternity. And so our system is just one of those. You know, imagine a god who's just learning his craft of making universes. So God tries this universe, it's like, oh, that didn't work out. Let's see if we can get better. I don't know if any of you are watching this TV comedy, The Good Place. Um, it's very philosophical. It's pretty awesome. Um, and it was, uh, well, anyway, one of the creators was a UT grad who did philosophy here. In any event, um, that show has somebody trying to craft a dimension of hell, basically, for these people. <laughs> And I think we're now up to version 802 of his attempt to craft this hell dimension. So uh, this is something that you might say uh, we can imagine, right? This god is trying it out, just as you might write a paper and you're just trying out writing and you write more and more and you get better and better. So this god might be making more and more universes, practicing getting better. Or maybe it was made by a committee. Think about this watch again. Who made this watch? Who designed this watch? Was there one person? Is there one guy at Apple who crafted the Apple watch, right? Who designed it? Um, is there one person who made it? No, it's something made by a bunch of people, designed by a bunch of people. A lot of things get done by committee and by people taking over parts of the task and working on projects in groups. And so maybe a lot of people, maybe, there might have been a committee that made this universe. How do we know it was one being? So even, now this in a way is a more serious challenge. It, in the sense that, it's saying, look, Paley, suppose you're right. <laughs> suppose the universe is like a was. Suppose it was designed. Suppose it was made. Still, we don't have the argument for one being. It could be that a committee made it, that a committee designed it. And so we don't get one god out of that. We might get a bunch of, well, Yes, supernatural beings in the sense that they can make a universe, but on the other hand, by no means perfect or even infinite beings. Well, maybe it's imperfect because it was made by multiple. <laughs> That's true. Maybe it was imperfect because it was made that way. Uh, sometimes you read something and you can tell it was written by a committee. Uh, and that's not generally a positive thing to say about it. <laughs> um, usually things written by committees are boring and uninteresting. And so similarly, uh, yeah, to say it might have been made by a committee, mm, that might explain a lot of the imperfections. It was a compromise. <laughs> now, Hume's giving us skeptical arguments here. So the way to think about that, this is not to think, oh, Hume thinks the universe was crafted by a committee of gods who were learning their craft or something. He's basically saying lots of hypotheses are possible. You could use a lot of models for trying to understand what the universe is like. Yes, it could be like a watch, 
Maybe it's like a plant, maybe it's like an animal, maybe it's like a, a looking glass or a sandbox or a donut or whatever. It's something that, uh, you know, there are many different ways of constructing an analogy to try to explain something about the universe. There are many hypotheses you could make about a designer, about a maker for the universe. We have no evidence how to select the best. We are soon going to be talking about skeptical arguments in general. And Gisela Stryker argues that skeptical arguments have the following form. Typically, there is a variability premise, saying many hypotheses are possible. There are lots of different ways of perceiving this, or looking at it, or drawing conclusions about it. Secondly, undecidability. We have no basis for selecting among those possible hypotheses. So conclusion is, we cannot know. We can't choose among the possibilities. We can't establish, in this case, God's existence. Hume is more or less saying, there are lots of things you might use as models, lots of ways in which you might draw conclusions about a designer or a maker or something like that. There is no way to choose among those, so there's no way to have any confidence that God exists on the basis of these arguments. He says, we just have no data that we're going to select among these various options. Yeah. Uh, for human skepticism, it can skepticism kind of be seen on a spectrum? Or like, you know, I believe that some things we can't know, but other things we oh. can, or does he just believe we don't, we can't know anything ever? Okay, uh, you're, that's a great point. Skepticism is not something that's at all sort of yes everything or no everything. It's about particular things, typically, and there are degrees of skepticism. And so all we've got here is humans a skeptic about these things. Now, as we see later, he's a skeptic about a lot of other things. But yes, for the moment, just think about these particular arguments and their ability to prove anything about God's existence or non-existence. Now, there are other arguments he gives about difficulties in nature. After all, nature doesn't seem perfect. And here, I think he's coming close to one of the three classic arguments against God's existence. One of those arguments is an argument from incoherence. It basically says the idea of God is incoherent in some way. Um, people ask questions like this. Um, <laughs> could, rock, could God create a rock so heavy he cannot lift it? Could God heat a burrito that was so hot he couldn't eat it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, most people don't take arguments like that all that seriously, but anyway, that is one possible kind of argument. A second one is an argument from the completeness of physics and science. Basically saying, all you need to understand the world of science, you don't need anything else, and so there's simply no need for the hypothesis that God exists. But the most serious of these arguments, the one that really bothers people at an emotional level, as well as occupies them philosophically, is the last one, the problem of evil. How could a perfect being create a world that contains so much evil? In fact, that contains any evil at all. So, oh, I've already talked about those. So let's go to, yeah, blah, 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 this. Here is the classic argument from evil. And this is something that Hume gets around to finally and states explicitly. If God exists, then at least according to the classical conception of God, God is all good, all knowing, and all powerful. But if he's all good, he's willing to prevent evil. If he's all knowing, he knows how to prevent it. If he's all powerful, he can prevent it. But there is evil. So God does not exist. Now, since at this point we have one minute left, um, I can't survey all the possible answers to this. The challenge this presents for anyone who believes in God is to give what is known as a theodicy. A theodicy is an attempt to explain how you can reconcile the existence of God with the existence of evil. And I've got a little chart that shows you possible ways of doing it. Oh yeah, that many kinds of evil pictured here. I'll let you I'll, <laughs> Anyway, I'll, oh yes, that, that's my favorite one. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> there are only certain possible solutions, okay? Um, if God is perfect and the world isn't, where'd the problem come from? Maybe it came from the design, but that's awfully close to God. Maybe it comes from matter. Maybe it comes from the people who built it. Maybe it came from us. That is to say, it's user error. <laughs> Maybe it's due to our own free will and our own bad choices. 